Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. Okay. Yeah, we need the everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group. I'm your host, Olga Olaker, recording remotely, as seems to be our new MO. And far away from me is my co-host. Hugh Pope, and still stuck in Brussels. And with us today is Alek Shakirov, who is a senior expert at the Center for Advanced Governance, a consultant at the Pierce Center, and an affiliate with the Russian International Affairs Council. And he's joining us from Moscow. Welcome, Alek. Olga, Hugh, thank you for having me. So Alek has written about a great many things. He is a specialist on arms control. He's worked on cybersecurity issues. He co-hosts a podcast, which if you speak Russian, you should definitely check out. I've been a guest. Uh, it's called Prinuždenie k miru, or in English, Peace Enforcement. But it is in Russian, so if you don't speak Russian, I don't think the technology is quite up to Google translating podcasts. But it really is interesting with a lot of guests covering a lot of topics. What we wanted to talk to Oleg about today, though, he's been doing a good bit of work on how Russian diplomacy and Russian foreign policy are changing in the 21st century. So we thought we'd take the opportunity to ask him about what he's learning as he looks into these issues. And one of the topics he's been writing about is digital diplomacy. And I have to admit, maybe it's a factor of being Generation X, but Alek, my first thought when I hear digital diplomacy is, what is that? I actually started looking at this when Russian diplomacy was not that digital. That was around 2011, 2012. And uh, I remember my first impression was that the foreign ministry released some kind of a report and it was published as a Word document. And I just thought you could have done some basic design, it would be nice. And back then, social media started becoming big in international relations. And again, Russian foreign ministry was not there. And uh, I thought, why are they are not doing this? And since then, uh, the foreign ministry has done actually a very impressive job. Because traditionally, if you talk to Russian diplomats or Russian experts focusing on international relations, they would describe foreign ministry as this conservative institution that is steeped in tradition and has a long history and is really appreciates this longevity and continuity. Since around 2012-13, seeing this change, and now Russian diplomacy is closely associated with this digital dimension. What does that mean? So there are many definitions, and when I read a lecture about this, I usually define it broadly. But usually when scholars of this phenomenon describe it, they most often focus on the use of social media. So basically, in Russia, foreign ministry and individual missions, they have really become increasingly prominent on social media. And this has emerged as one of important challenges for Russian diplomacy. There have been many controversies related to that. There were like minor and major scandals and some things that are just disputed within Russia or in foreign media. But still, compared to what it was about a decade ago, it is quite different. So we're talking about things like the Twitter feeds of the different embassies where they get into Twitter fights with analysts, with other governments. This is what you mean? Exactly, exactly. Can you point to an example like, for instance, the Chinese embassy in Paris put out an extraordinary little social media video challenging the American narrative on the pandemic and putting forward the idea that China had really been trying to help all along and America was actually the one that was putting up its nose in the air. Is there a Russian embassy that's done something like that? It's interesting that you mentioned China because China for a while was just standing aside and looking at what Russia and Europeans and Americans were doing. And first it was some European diplomats like Carl Bildt. He was uh, one of first digital diplomats. Then Russia became big. Then you had Trump and Trump started like tweeting on very sensitive issues. And China was standing somewhere like aside looking at this. And since last year, China has really invested more on this. And now we have stories like this when a Chinese ambassador in a European country would be using his personal account to tweet something like that. It's big in the sense that previously diplomats were kind of more used to private conversations and now they are discovering this new like medium where they can get immediate reaction and then it gets to newspapers. Your leadership back home is happy with you because you help spread your message. So in Russia, we had several stories like that, but maybe one which is 
four years ago now, but still probably the most retweeted tweet produced by Russian digital diplomacy account was the one that Russian embassy in London posted in December 2016, right after the one administration imposed sanctions on Russia. And they posted this image of a duck with the word lame written on it and saying something that even without 30 diplomats, we can work and we are all waiting for this administration to go, something like that. So they basically called Obama lame duck. And uh, the message was clear that uh, they didn't like this measure taken by the Obama administration and they were looking for some new stage in bilateral relations. But then again, they did it in a manner that was very like social media friendly, like super provocative and was like controversial. Some people always, and myself included, speculate whether this should be even part of diplomacy or not, but it is diplomacy nowadays. It's organic part of diplomacy. So I think Russia's UK embassy has been particularly active. I wonder how they feel about that tweet, though, in retrospect from, you know, in terms of what they did get after Obama left. But I think more to the point, and you brought up Donald Trump's Twitter feed, we've talked about the Chinese narrative versus the American narrative. There's a disinformation aspect of this, right? Some of this is that it's diplomats going directly to the people and not just the people in the country to which they're accredited, but people all over the world who can read social media, but, you know, putting out their country's story. But there also have been accusations against pretty much everybody of lying when they do that. And social media doesn't have the levels of fact checks that traditional media at least used to have. Is that something that you're looking at in your research that part of the result is that it muddies the waters on what's true and what's not? Because in principle, an embassy is an authoritative source. So if embassies are arguing about what the truth is, you get into this very strange situation. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. And this is one of the reasons why I'm no longer a big like supporter of digital diplomacy. As I described back in 2012, when I was uh, way more enthusiastic about this, I was thinking that, wow, we should definitely do it because of all the reasons that you described, that you can directly interact with the whole world and you don't need intermediaries. Right now, we've seen many examples where this is becoming like toxic and is not very helpful to improving relations and to building trust. Even though I'm often critical of like Russia and some other individual countries, I think it's a general phenomenon because we see that the language that diplomats use online is becoming more and more loose, less restrained. And there is a like official diplomacy and then there is something that is not diplomacy and then there is diplomacy on social media. As it is now, more things are allowed there. And so you can retweet controversial article and it's not always clear, even if you have an official account, whether it's like an official message or not an official message. So the general sense is that it's not that serious. It's not as serious as an official statement. For example, Russian foreign ministry has been very much in trend, but like maybe with a different perspective. But when discussion about fake news started in the West, Russian foreign ministry also had the same kind of processes going within it. And there is even a special designated page right now on the foreign ministry's website where they label specific stories as fake news and describe why those are fake. And again, this is like controversial because uh, some of those are like interviews with uh, foreign officials and they promote their official line. But then is it okay to call it fake news or not? So we are kind of in the same field. But of course, Russia is in different position because vis-a-vis -vis the West, we are always the ones who are accused. And media-wise, Russia does not have the same power. So it's always described in the West that Russia can like successfully undermine Western narratives. While I think in Russia, the feeling is quite different because these like huge media companies are all like American or European and they have much more influence on domestic narratives in Russia. So if something is a story in New York Times, then probably it's going to be a story in Russia. Whereas if something is a big story in Kemersan, then it's not guaranteed that uh, anyone will hear about it. So, and this is not specifically about diplomats, but they exist in this environment, so they have to somehow adapt to it. Isn't that just a question of credibility, though? I mean, you've talked in the past about uh, Western information monopoly, for instance, but isn't that because of uh, what Olga was talking about earlier, the fact-check nature of mainstream Western media still having, despite everything, a certain influence in the world? Yeah, no, I, I will not dispute it, but there are some stories that are not, like, correct, and there was a proliferation of, like, Russian meddling stories and some of them were not properly fact-checked. And you cannot dedicate, within foreign ministry or within the embassy, you cannot dedicate like big chunk of your workforce to these issues because you have other work. And then again, for example, because Russian 
reputation in the West and the United States has been like on the low. So, for example, if Russian embassy in Washington posts a rebuttal, it's not guaranteed that it will be quoted by local media. But I agree that there is an issue of credibility. And uh, Is that changing, Oleg? Because there's certainly a feeling that the fact-check nature of Western media is definitely less fact-checked than it used to be. And there's a sense that the politicians in the West have been chasing mirages, dreams, and peddling lies at the same time as it's not necessarily clear that uh, everything that Russia or other countries are saying it necessarily lies. So isn't there a change of the balance going on? I don't know about the change of the balance, but well, I don't want to go too far into this direction. But let me say that there was several commentaries in Russian, like in media sphere that previously, like American media specifically was considered kind of a golden standard for journalism. And over past several years, specifically in the context of this, like Russia related scandals, uh, this credibility has been undermined, not of Western politicians or like Western institutions, but of Western media, because in some cases, they were like biased stories or like politically charged stories. And it was like sitting in Russia, it was very kind of obvious. And so some journalists, they became maybe dissatisfied with this model. I think there is a general trend, but of course there are specifics in, in each country. And I'm not trying to take some moral high ground or I don't know about like changing political balance. But maybe we all need to learn from these mistakes in one way or another. I always remember listening to the voices coming from Moscow newsrooms in the run-up to the Iraq war, for instance, where it, it was very clear that, and especially during the early stages of the Syrian conflict, that the rather cynical style of the commentators in Moscow, and I did say even the official voices, seemed to be somewhat more realistic than the kind of wishful thinking that would come from Western capitals. Is that something that Russian diplomacy is trying to take advantage of because being known as the realists or am I just uh, a wishful thinker myself? No, I agree. I think I can talk like for a long time about Iraq because it has been such huge like blunder in my perspective. And uh, from Russian diplomats, they always refer back to Iraq and sometimes it gets boring. But uh, you can see their point because few people have been held accountable for mistakes made prior to the invasion of Iraq. Like in general, there is no acknowledgement, even though like Obama was elected as an anti-Iraq war like president. There is no like acknowledgement that we made this huge mistake like on the US behalf. Media organizations, of course, there was some like reflection that, well, maybe we did not like question information that we received. Right now, there is this Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. And there is this like fictional role of media as it's always some kind of uh, the fourth power. Only like media in Russia can be manipulated, but Western media cannot be manipulated. My favorite stories are whenever there is a leak from intelligence community. For all kinds of like reasons, people who have access to these sources, they will just generally report it. Sometimes it's confirmed sometimes it's not but it's problematic because in russia like if you would have a story in russia based totally on intelligence leak you would not consider it trustworthy i know from personal experience going back to a question that whether russia tries to exploit this i think russian diplomacy goes back to this iraq case because it's a clear illustration of how american specifically was not successful in resolving any serious issue because we have all kinds of problems that originate with this decision to invade Iraq. And some people in different countries forget it. Some people need better relations with the United States, so they like pretend to forget it. But it was a big problem. And of course, Russia is trying to highlight this moment because that was the moment that like many in Russia, I think, put this. And diplomats, of course, feel like Russia was more justified and the Russian concerns about what could happen after the invasion. Uh, they were not unreasonable. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and Hugh Pope and I, Olga Olker, are talking to Oleg Shakirov in Moscow about Russian digital diplomacy and how Russian diplomacy in the 21st century is changing. So I think, you know, we've kind of, we've painted a picture where the overall information environment is just, I don't know if I even want to say less reliable, right? I think arguably it was never all that reliable. It was just that people had a tendency to trust what they read. There are only in so many sources, if they disagree, then one of them will turn out to be true. We're now in an environment where there are just so many sources of information. Diplomats are part of it. They're jumping into the fray with their own ideas. They may change, right? Somebody may tweet something one month and something completely opposite the next because, well, they got more information, they changed their minds or the policy line changed. So, you know, I think part of the issue is that there's just so much material saying so many things coming out and fact checking is difficult. I do think your point that Westerners believe that an intelligence agency leak means that, ooh, it's great information that's probably true. And people in many other parts of the world think an intelligence agency leak means the intelligence agency wants me to believe the following things. 
And I think that's a really important bias to unpack. But I also, if we have time, I'd like to come back to some of this, but I kind of want to shift in another direction towards something that is a more traditional form of diplomacy, but which Russia has gotten more active with in the recent past and that you and I have been writing about, and that's humanitarian assistance. And particularly in COVID, Russia's humanitarian aid got a lot of press. I'm not sure if it got a lot of the effects it wanted. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the aid shipments to the United States, to Italy. Those were, I think, the ones that got the most attention and whether Russia got what it wanted for them. What did it want? What was it trying to do? I think it wanted different things in different contexts. I like that you pointed out these two examples as Italy and uh, the United States, which were most prominent, but they were not probably the most significant. My colleagues and I, we assembled this like small database of countries that uh, Russia helped during this period since the beginning of February until now. And there are, I don't know, can, can you guess how many countries we have? 20, 30. 50. I'm just going to guess very randomly. Okay, yeah. So it's it's 45 countries for now. And um, some of those are, let's say, more political. So the United States, of course, it was agreed by the two presidents. There was a lot of media coverage. And it was symbolical that during these like hard times, we want to send uh, some kind of aid. And actually, the United States then sent some aid back to Russia. There were, I guess, maybe already two supplies. So it was very symbolical. In the case of Italy, of course, it was mixed. On the one hand, of course, it was also this like image of Russia that is capable of helping a Western a European country, a member of NATO. And you can contrast this with what Italy got from other NATO countries. So there was, of course, that. But on the other hand, so what the Minister of Defense, who was coordinating this effort, what they emphasized was that this was also helpful to learn some lessons and to see how lessons learned could be applied in Russia. The countries that got most aid from Russia were those from the Commonwealth of Independent States and other countries across the Russian borders. So this includes North Korea, China, Mongolia, most CIA states, except for Ukraine. But uh, even in Ukraine, Russia supplied medical supplies to Donetsk and Lugansk. And to the other breakaways, we actually put out a we put out a short briefing on this at the start of the conflict on the situation with COVID in the breakaways, and certainly Russia supplies were a big part of that story. Yeah. So in case of these countries, of course, there was political motive that Russia is uh, kind of leader of this, of this like Eurasian sphere and of like of the Commonwealth of Independent States and primarily of the Euro Eurasian Economic Union. Also, you can see here like natural interest that we, we want populations in these countries to be more helpful. That's why we want to build a capacity to fight coronavirus. And uh, it's always mixed. And in all like instances we see maybe the United States was the most clear example of this like like public diplomacy. So did it work? Did Russia get what it wanted from these aid shipments? I think it's too early to tell. But in general, I would say that within these countries around Russia, this help has been appreciated. Another indicator that Russia did not waste its money was that some countries like the United States did provide some assistance back to Russia. So for example, Russia helped China in February and in April or in May, China provided some medical supplies back to Russia. Russia provided test systems to Uzbekistan and Uzbekistan provided face masks back to Russia. Turkmenistan also helped Russia. So we see some examples of this. My more general remark would be that this whole system of of, uh, providing development assistance and humanitarian assistance is kind of always evolving in Russia. And maybe this increased prominence of aid during uh, coronavirus will allow Russian bureaucracy to draw some lessons because, of course, there are problems with coordination and with like measuring effectiveness of aid. So I could be more to answer your question in a year, I would say. Oleg, for seen from the outside, we have a tendency to assume that Russian policy gestures are for external consumption. How are they perceived internally? And sort of perhaps referring a bit to your social media work, to what extent is Russian foreign policy, which we've always seen as a very state-driven thing, now becoming enmeshed in what the population thinks? And for instance, what was that partly to get the population behind state policy? So first, I would say, uh, looking at who supplied aid, it remains very much like government driven, because most supplies that we recorded, they were provided by government agencies, or by some other bodies that are kind of affiliated with the government. So for example, Rosatom was provided some face masks in Belarus or about what Russian populations thought about this. I don't think there was much discussion. Of course, there was similar debates as maybe in the United States, like why do we need to help these developed countries while we have problems with supplies to our, uh, Russian hospitals? My opinion was that it was not that prominent. Maybe in general, some of the aid supplies that we recorded were not very much well documented compared to like Serbia, Italy and the United States, which were publicized and you could see some nice shots on TV. So... 
I know the Soviet Union did a lot of development assistance, right? I mean, that was a huge part of Soviet foreign policy, grants and uh, technical assistance in agriculture, in infrastructure, roads, uh, food aid, all of that. And it was a very big part of kind of the Soviet Union's self-image and its global presentation of itself. And also, I think Soviet leaders saw it as a way of making friends, right? So did American policymakers. Political scientists will tell you that doesn't usually work that well, but countries keep trying it anyway, right? The idea that if I provide enough aid, this country will then be an ally. Do you think that Russia is going to be doing more of that, that Russia is going to start looking more like the Soviet Union in its efforts to provide development and humanitarian assistance? Because, you know, Russia, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, has certainly done a lot less. I agree. And this is an ongoing debate in Russia because it's formally called International Development Assistance. And there is a special document, a kind of strategic conceptual document from 2014. But as you rightly pointed out, Russia has not been doing this on the scale comparable to the Soviet Union. Russia was not doing this, as you said. And right now that might be changing. One indicator is that we have a special agency that is not comparable to aid agencies in other countries, but it was at a certain point considered to be kind of a similar agency, which is called Rosotrunistvo, like Russian agency with a long name for international cooperation, compatriots and stuff like that, and cultural diplomacy. If you look at this agency, they have a lot of responsibilities, like cultural diplomacy, diaspora relations and stuff like that. Part of it is uh, foreign aid. This foreign aid part was not very well developed. And um, as it used to be done in Russia for past decade, was that each individual agency or like state corporation or like business, they did their own thing. And this was kind of coordinated within the government. Right now you have a new director of this agency of Rosotrunistvo, uh, Evgeny Primakov. He is the uh, grandson of the uh, late Evgeny Primakov, who is well known as a Russian foreign minister and uh, Prime Minister. What's interesting, Evgeny Primakov, over the past couple of years, he, he has been advocating for more emphasis on humanitarian and development aid. And he has a uh, first-hand experience because he worked for the UNHCR for a while. And he has his own like NGO called Russian Humanitarian Mission, which provides, I would say, mostly humanitarian aid and some other educational aid to countries in the Balkans, to Palestine, uh, to Syria, I guess. Seems like a conflict of interest, no? Can he be both personal aid provision and government aid provision? That's an interesting question. I don't know how they worked out with that, but it's interesting that he was very vocal about this and he was critical of current Russian like approach to soft power, to how Rosatrunistvo worked, and he was appointed. So you can interpret this as a signal that some things will be changing in this area. I haven't seen this so far, so this is my expectation. And in his first couple of interviews, he said that we need to do less like tea drinking parties, reading Russian poetry and more concrete results oriented stuff. And he described it in a very international non-governmental organization type of manner. So he said we need to develop like logistics to understand what are the needs. And uh, so, yeah, we'll see. Russia has been providing aid over the past five years on the scale of about like one billion dollars a year to countries in the former Soviet Union, some older like Soviet client states like PRK and uh, Cuba and some states in Africa. But it has not been what the Soviet Union was doing. It was not like building some projects. I don't want to make this answer even longer, but you can see some other projects that during the Soviet period, they would probably be considered part of this development. And right now they probably fall under the commercial just projects. So for example, Rosatom is building a lot of power plants and this is done in a different kind of manner. Yeah, but still, so Russia is, is investing in uh, building infrastructure in some countries and in uh, helping them develop, but it's not maybe doing this in this like traditional development development way, but this might be also be changing. I think that's really a interesting and a great point that, you know, the foreign aid budget isn't all of Russia's foreign aid. We are out of time, which I think is really unfortunate because I feel like we could continue this conversation and go on to a whole lot set of other topics like, you know, comparative foreign aid budgets and also how other countries might channel things that look like aid through other mechanisms. You know, defense, for instance, defense assistance doesn't fall under foreign aid, but especially the way you, the US does it, it can get very, it can get very mushy. It would also be really interesting, for instance, to unpack different philosophies of humanitarian projects and conditions under which aid is provided. 
But we're going to have to save that for another conversation. Alec, thank you so much for joining us and giving us so much food for thought today. Thank you so much. If you want to read some of the results of Alec's and his colleagues' work on Russian COVID-19 related assistance, it has now been published. It's available on the website of the Russian Center for Advanced Governance. That's cpur.ru. Unfortunately, for those of us of those of you who don't speak Russian, it is only in Russian. But in addition to the written analysis, they have a really cool interactive map of Russian COVID aid, which you can probably figure out even if your Russian is a bit rusty. You can also follow Oleg on Twitter. He is at S-H-A-K-I-R-O-V-2036. So at Shakirov2036. You should also follow Crisis Group and us on Twitter. Crisis Group is at Crisis Group. Olya is at Olya Olika. That's O-L-Y-A-O-L-I-K-E-R. And I'm at Hugh Pope with an underscore between my two names. And you can check out our own publications and materials, as always, on the Crisis Group website, crisisgroup.org. And do check us out on Facebook and Instagram, which is also at Crisis Group. And when you're on Twitter, uh, you know, you should feel free to tweet at us about anything you like or don't like in the podcast. Uh, we will listen. If you're listening through iTunes, uh, we wouldn't mind at all and might even encourage you to leave us a rating and maybe a review. And if you're interested in the wider European neighborhood, War and Peace is part of the Europod network. So do check out some of their other podcasts. So big thanks to our producer, uh, Europod Bull Media. Big thanks to Miranda Sunnix, our all-round coordinator and instigator for War and Peace. Thanks in this case of this podcast to Gabriela Rosa Hernandez. Uh, she was a bit of a silent partner for the effort. Uh, she has been interning with the Europe and Central Asia program at Crisis Group. And finally, the biggest thanks of all, as always, go to you, our listeners. We're looking forward to talking to you again in about two weeks. And it's a goodbye from me too. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.